Good morning, folks. Um, look, lovely to have you and good morning to everybody there who's tuning in. Um, you're very welcome to this, the first in our uh, four part series of Brexit webinars. So this is the, the first one, obviously. We're gonna have them every Tuesday for the next four weeks um, with, uh, I suppose, different, different themes. But as you know, today, it's all about small business. So uh, today marks exactly 100 days, would you believe, until the end of the transition period um, and the ninth round of talks between the EU and the UK will get underway next week on September 28th. And we will be watching that very closely. Um, so today's session will focus on small business and how they will be impacted by Brexit. We're going to look at supply chains, we're going to look at economic operators and the various steps that SMEs will need to take to prepare themselves for the changes which are will be brought about and which are coming um, very, very soon now. So um, joining us today are Mary White. Mary is the head of NSAI's Brexit unit. Mary, thanks for being with us this morning. Yeah, um, and also we have Neil MacDonald, the CEO of Isme. Neil, thanks so much. Uh, we really appreciate you being here this morning. I mean, you're you're dealing directly with small businesses every day, so you will uh, you'll be aware of, I suppose, some of the issues that are coming up. So um, thank you both again for being here. Um, what we'll do is just to let people know what the agenda this morning is. We are going to hear from our speakers first. So we'll go to Neil first, um, and then we'll, Mary will follow. And after that, we'll open it up for our Q&A discussion. So if people have questions, please feel free to type them into our chat box there. Um, and we'll do our very best to get through those at the end of the session. Um, but obviously, we will have follow up information for you at the end as well that we'll be posting out after the webinar. So if you don't mind, we will leave the questions to the end. Uh, the session should last about 45 minutes, so we, we should have plenty of time to, to deal with those. So without further ado, I think we will hand over to Neil. Uh, Neil, what I'll do is I'll share your slides for you uh, and then you can fire away. So just give me a moment there, please. Thanks, Deirdre. While your team goes up, Deirdre, if I could just say, first of all, thanks to uh, the NSAI for the invitation uh, to speak on the topic uh, because we've been doing roadshows for the members uh, since 2017 now on, on Brexit. So obviously this is um, a, a topic that affects SMEs arguably more than anyone else. Um, and standards and certification are actually key to this. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, tariffs later on, but um, a, a lot of people felt that the, the, the whole thing about Brexit initially when it kicked off was the fear of tariffs, but actually tariffs are a secondary concern for a great many businesses. So if, if I just uh, kick off and introduce uh, by saying that although legally the UK has left uh, the, U the EU, uh, in, uh, as they currently stand, they're in transition. And that means they're observing all the laws and customs and duties and responsibilities of the EU and they're doing so until the end of December. <clears throat> uh, they're, they're gone on, on the 1st of January or 2nd uh, from then on. And um, as things stand now, and this would be a political observation more than anything else, but a, a hard or WTO style, Canada style uh, Brexit looks more likely, uh, simply because we're dealing with an extremely narrow window to put anything comprehensive in place by then. The other thing, though, I would observe from a practical point of view is that even if we got a, a, a free trade agreement, a reasonably comprehensive uh, trade agreement over the line by the next summit, which is promised in October, um, having that in place and functioning by the 1st or 2nd of January would actually be very difficult. So uh, don't hold your breath. So Deirdre, if you could move on to the second slide there. Um, the, the next thing is for people to understand, because believe it or not, a lot of people don't realize that they're actually affected. So um, especially small businesses that inhabit somewhere along the middle of a supply chain, uh, the free, uh, the single market and the customs union has made um, trade in, in goods and, and services largely uh, seamless within the EU for the last uh, 30, 35 years or so. Um, and it's only now, as uh, some people are looking at their supply chains, that they're realizing that they're actually integrated into 
a supply chain that has inbound from the UK or where they're exporting to the UK. Now, I would make a general observation that exporters have prepared themselves better than importers. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that's down to each individual company. But it's very common for small businesses in the food uh, supply chain and the manufacturing supply chain to be embedded in a very small part of a very long supply chain. So the mantra we tell to people is look two suppliers up and two customers down to understand your impacts. And if you're, uh, if you're the supplier uh, of a product, um, you, you know, you're, you're buying some part of that product from somewhere, you need to put pressure on your suppliers and you need, you're their customer and you need to ask them for confirmations, verifications, and guarantees. Uh, don't accept someone's word for it. Don't say, don't accept someone telling you it's all right, it'll be all right on the, on the night. Get professional assistance from people like the NSAI. Um, similarly, if, if uh, you're the vendor, you are going to find people asking you uh, if, if you're selling into the UK or, or for some products that are, that are going into Northern Ireland, you're going to be asked for confirmations and verifications and guarantees. Uh, Deirdre, if I could go on to the next one, please. Um, ju just to uh, put some, uh, you know, give a real world example of this. I mean, we have a member who is a supplier into the construction trade and they supply fire curtains. Uh, into commercial buildings. These are the things that improve the fire rating for a building. Um, the initial call that came in to us was, what's the tariff that's applied to fire curtains? Now, I went through uh, the tariffs and I'll, I'll show you how to interrogate that uh, later. Um, and I couldn't find any tariffs uh, associated with uh, fire curtains, but I asked the company, could they send along the product data sheets for the fire curtains they were buying, which were manufactured um, by a UK company. And generally when you look, so th there are some standards associated with fire curtains down uh, the, the um, right hand side of the screen there. And what you're looking at, and Mary is going to go into this, in, in, is the guru on this, but generally EN standards are, are European and, and they will carry. But what you're looking to make sure is that where there is a British standard that it has an equivalent and that you are certain that that is good to go in Ireland. Um, you, you just have to be very careful of that. So um, could I go on then uh, to the next one there? Yeah, please Deirdre, yeah, go one forward again. I'm backwards now, am I? Apologies. Uh, yeah, uh, just oh, okay. the, sorry, yeah, go forward there. Um, and You've just done that one. And another one. So, um, oh, apologies. No. <laughs> there we go. That's okay. Just um, I will be uh, talking um, in in a few moments when I talk about the help page. But Intertrade Ireland is uh, especially helpful with this, uh, especially if you're doing cross border trade into NI, and you can get grants because my my last slide is going to uh, show a help page where you can get professional assistance. But the state is giving you assistance to buy that professional help and you can get grants from Intertrade Ireland of up to 2,250 euro to pay for that assistance. So Deirdre, if you could move on to the next one now. Um, just a quick word on tariffs. Um, most tariffs are actually less than 8% uh, with the exception of food products. Now, obviously, if you're involved in beef or dairy, um, uh, tariffs are, are going to be commercially extremely damaging but the vast majority of tariffs are actually less than 8%. And, and in fact, you know, they tend to be in the two, three, four, five 5% uh, range. So some businesses are able to arrange their cost base to absorb that or to pass it on at a cost uh, less than the, the full amount of the tariff. Um, in, in the old days, interrogating whether your product was tariffed was extremely difficult and you had to go on to the WTO and there was a massive spreadsheet that you had to look up. But Intertrade Ireland has put up uh, a tariff checker now on their webpage 
and um, NSAI is going to share those slides afterwards. And where you see the word tariff checker there, that's a hot link into the tariff checker. And the great thing is that you can interrogate that tariff checker in plain English. You can just do a word search on it and find out if you're affected by tariffs. But the vast majority of, of products, believe it or not, aren't tariffed. So you're not going to be commercially affected. Um, it's going to be all the other stuff, unfortunately, that affects you. So Deirdre, if you can move it on there one. Um, and, and this is where we do uh, get into the tricky area of standards, but also other things. Um, you're going to be asked for certification on certain uh, areas where, you're, where you are uh, buying products from the UK or you're exporting products to the UK. But there are also other commercial issues, and, and this is where we get outside of uh, statute law and we get into common and contractual law, many small businesses um, are importers or they're distributors. Um, and you could be one of those. And you could be subject to, as things currently stand, you may have a license or a contract or a distribution agreement or a territorial agreement. We find this a lot with cosmetics uh, and beauty products. Um, that there are particular chains of, of pharmacies or high street stores um, that have a license, a distribution uh, agreement on a beauty product. Um, and some of those products will have standards or certification attached to them. Anything for human consumption or use tends to. Similarly, if you're exporting to the UK, uh, that regime is subject to change. Again, in general, I'll make the observation that exporters have pre uh, prepared themselves better than importers. So please watch out. Uh, it's not all about tariffs. In fact, tariffs are a very small part of the problem. And uh, Deirdre, if you can go on to the last one. Uh, and um, finally, and this is my last slide for you, uh, there is help available. We have uh, a Brexit omnibus page where we hot link to uh, sources of professional assistance, but also financial assistance. Uh, again, that hot link there on the slide is the hot link into our page. And generally I use, I, I, in fact, all the time uh, when I do the roadshows, I have the professional assistance of a customs uh, expert and a solicitor, and you will find um, their links, uh, Derek Dunn and Paul McMahon on our help page. So um, I, hopefully that's been of some assistance to you. And when we get to the q and I'll pick up on any questions you have. Thanks very much, Deirdre. Thank you, Neil. Thank you very much. Uh, Mary, if you can turn back on your camera there now, if you're still with us. Neil, that was really excellent. Thank you. Very clear. And I think it's a nice segue into what Mary's going to do for us. Um, so I suppose we'll, we'll go straight into your talk, Mary. So if you wouldn't mind sharing your screen there now for us, please. Uh, while I'm doing that, I suppose just to let you know, Mary is the head of our uh, Brexit unit. The, the unit was set up in 2018 and really it's to support Irish businesses on mitigating the impact of Brexit. Um, and I suppose that's the area of products and certification, which Mary has extensive experience in. So Mary and the team have been busy over the last couple of years, um, not only, I suppose, advising a government on policy issues, but also uh, traveling the length and breadth of the country, uh, giving webinars and also taking part or giving, uh, sorry, not webinars, but uh, um, I suppose a series of roadshows uh, and also supporting other government activities. So Mary, I see you're ready to roll there. Uh, whenever you're ready, take it away, please. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much, Neil, for your contribution to our talks today. Um, at the moment, for all of you, it's very hard to focus on Brexit, while at the same time you are trying to work in a COVID environment. And as Dee and Neil have said, there's just 100 days left to the end of this transition period. So for the next 15 minutes, um, I'm going to talk to you uh, about your supply chain in terms of economic operators, and I will outline the current and future role for them. So the EU it, uh, legislation defines the four economic operators and the roles they play in placing products on the EU market. Uh, the four um, are the manufacturer, the importer, the authorized representative, and the distributor. 
Now I'm going to examine the roles and responsibilities of each of these, and I will explain the role they play in market surveillance, which is to ensure that products placed on the EU market must comply with EU legislation. Here are some examples. Uh, I have three examples here uh, that, in, uh, that are currently uh, pl placed on the market. So in the first instance, most sockets are imported and distributed from the UK. Uh, smoke alarms are both manufactured in Ireland and they're also imported and distributed in Ireland. But medical face masks are imported into Ireland. And all of these products must be CE marked and they have to go third party um, conformity testing uh, to be able to issue their CE marking. That's just to give you an example and a flavour of what we are talking about. So I'm now going to start to talk about the role of the manufacturer. Well, EU law defines the manufacturer as the natural or legal person who manufactures a product or has a product designed or manufactured, and he places it on the market under his own name or trademark. The manufacturer does not need to be in the EU. They can be located anywhere in the world, but manufacturers from third non-EU countries are still subject to EU product legislation when they place their product on the EU market. And you must remember, where the product is put on the market defines which rules it must follow, not where it is manufactured. And the manufacturer is responsible for conformity assessment of the products to ensure it complies with the relevant EU legislation and for CE marking their product. Now I'm going to discuss conformity assessment, not today, but in more detail, I will discuss it in session four of our series on Tuesday, the 13th of October. Um, the manufacturer must put together what's known as a technical file before he can draw up his declaration of conformity. And this must include relevant design and manufacturing information, copies of all test results, the standards to which it is tested, and notify body certs if required by EU law. And the declaration of conformity must follow the format and include all of the information required by the relevant EU legislation. And finally, if there is a problem with a product, the manufacturer must cooperate with the relevant market surveillance authority. And for medical devices in Ireland, this would be the Health Products uh, Surveillance Authority, HPRA. Say for construction products, it would be the National Building Control Office. And for electrical sockets, it can be either the Competition and Consumer Protection Commission, known as CCPC, or the Commission for Communications Regulations, otherwise referred to as Comreg. Now, the importer. The importer is the economic operator established in the EU who places a product from a non-member state or third country on the EU market. Remember that it is where the product is placed on the market that defines which rules must be followed. So the importer must follow EU legislation when placing the goods on the EU market, not the law of the manufacturer's country. And an importer who places a product in a third country on the EU market in their own name becomes the manufacturer under EU law. And they take on all of the responsibilities of the manufacturer. The um, importer um, is responsible for ensuring that the manufacturer has met all of their obligations set out in EU legislation. And these include carrying out the correct conformity assessment procedure, drawing up the technical documentation, drawing up the EU declaration of conformity, affixing the CE marking, fulfilling their traceability obligations, and drawing up and including the required instructions and safety information for the product in the correct language. So remember, as the manufacturer is outside the legal jurisdiction of the EU, the importer becomes the main point of contact for market surveillance and takes on the bulk of the responsibilities from the manufacturer. So some of you today may be a distributor, but you may become an importer come January. Now the authorized representative is appointed by a manufacturer to act on their behalf in carrying out certain tasks. The uh, authorized representative must be established in an EU member state and a manufacturer from a third country can mandate an authorized representative to hold copies of their technical file. This means that they would not 
be obliged to give every one of their EU importers access to any intellectual properties or other sensitive information in the technical file. And where there is no general requirement for a manufacturer to appoint an authorised representative, uh, the EU legislation for medical devices, transportable pressure equipment and marine equipment do require a non-EU manufacturer to appoint an authorised representative. So now I'm going to talk to you about the distributor. Well, the distributor, its responsibilities uh, include uh, knowing, uh, is defined by the EU as an economic operator in the supply chain who is not a manufacturer, an importer, or an authorised representative. A distributor takes a product from a manufacturer or importer in the EU and either puts it on the market or supplies it to another distributor. Consequently, all distributors are located in an EU member state. If a distributor market pro markets products under their own name, they take over the manufacturer's responsibilities. And in this case, they must have sufficient information on the design, and the production of the product because they will be assuming the legal responsibility when affixing the CE marking and drawing up the declaration of conformity. The distributor's responsibilities include knowing which products must bear the CE marking and the accompanying documentation, be able to identify products that are not in compliance, and demonstrate to national authorities that they have confirmation from the manufacturer or the importer that the necessary measures have been taken. Distributors must cooperate with the competent national authorities in any investigation that they are carrying out. And this includes removing non-compliant products from the market and providing any relevant information to the relevant national authority. So to summarize here, I've got a table uh, which gives the responsibilities of economic operators. And the, the, it shows the differences in responsibilities between the manufacturer, the importer and distributor. So first here are the manufacturer's main responsibilities. So he has to provide the declaration of conformity in CE mark, and this is achieved by completing his technical file. As you can see, um, he also has to indicate a con contact point for the product, and he must keep the documentation for 10 years. Um, while the importer must be satisfied that the manufacturer has done all that is required, uh, he also too must keep the documentation for 10 years and indicate a point of contact for the product and uh, also include import details, uh, importer details on the product. Whereas the distributor must be satisfied that the product complies and all documents are available. So the distributor has fewer responsibilities than the manufacturers or the importers as they source their products from other economic operators already in the legal jurisdiction of the EU. But just bear in mind at the end of this year, while today you might be a distributor, if you then become, if you are then continuing to import a product from the UK, you will by default become an importer. Now, the EU regulation for market surveillance uh, is 768, and it sets out the requirements uh, for accreditation of market surveillance relating to the marketing of products and have put in place a framework for market surveillance. And market surveillance is normally carried out by uh, market surveillance authorities appointed by the government. And these must be public bodies who are appropriately resourced and have the authority to take necessary surveillance and enforcement actions. And at no stage can they delegate responsibility to a contractor or partner. And all economic operators must not knowingly place a non-compliant product on the market and must cooperate with market surveillance authorities carrying out the duties. So market surveillance authorities in Ireland include ourselves, NSEI for non-automatic weighing machines, uh, various state agencies such as the HPRA, CCPC, EPA and the HSA, um, local authorities and various government agencies, uh, government departments. So that's giving you a flavour of the market surveillance authorities, which they will have um, more uh, stronger roles moving forward in 2021. I now want to talk to you about the impact for the economic operation. So during the transition period, an Irish customer of a UK producer 
will see very little change. And this is because EU legislation continues to apply in the UK. And while the UK manufacturer is no longer in the EU, both they and Irish customers are still following the same rules. The producer in the UK remains a manufacturer and continues to be responsible for CE marking the product, holding the technical file and making the declaration of performance. And the customer in Ireland is still the distributor. And anyone who bought from him continues to be either the end user or if they sell on to someone else, a distributor. Now, the things are going to be very different when buying, uh, will be very diff diff different at the end of the transition period. And different rules will apply to goods purchased in Great Britain to those purchased in Northern Ireland. We shall first look at Irish businesses purchasing from a producer based in the Great Britain. The UK has left the EU and EU legislation no longer applies in Great Britain. The producer in the UK remains the manufacturer and continues to be responsible for CE marking the product, putting together the technical file and making the declaration of performance. However, everything changes for the customer in Ireland. As the first link of the supply chain within the EU, they become an importer. They take on the additional responsibilities of an importer discussed previously. And finally, anyone who bought from the importer continues to be either the end user or if they sell onto someone else, a distributor. Now, if we talk about Northern Ireland and if you're buying from a producer in Northern Ireland, while the UK has left the EU, the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland means that most EU legislation concerning manufactured products continues to apply in Northern Ireland for the purposes of trade on the island of Ireland. So the producer in Northern Ireland remains a manufacturer and continues to be responsible for CE marking the product, putting together the technical file and making the declaration of performance. And however, very little changes for their customers in the Republic of Ireland, as EU rules apply to the Northern Ireland manufacturer, they remain classified as a distributor in the Republic of Ireland, and they do not take on additional responsibilities of an importer as they do when buying from a manufacturer in Great Britain. The Irish customer who have bought from, their, from them continue to be either the end user or they sell on to someone else, a distributor. What is new is the goods manufactured in Northern Ireland will be marked with the new CE UK NI mark, but can only be placed on the Northern Ireland market. They cannot be placed on the EU market. Now, as Neil has already alluded to, um, Intertrade Ireland have got uh, Brexit vouchers up to 2,250 for professional advice in the areas for supply chain and for customs. And as you can see there, there it is eligible for those people trading north and south for manufacturing and tradable services registering on the island of Ireland and for employers who employ less than 250 employees. And as part of our support service, all of our slides will be available so you'll be able to get this information after this presentation. Now, what can I do and what can you do right now to minimize your disruption? Well, you should check your supply chain and make changes if necessary. And this could mean, do I get my supplies from the UK or do I now source in the rest of the EU? In terms of certification, if you are currently use a UK notified body, you need to transfer your certification to an EU 27 notified body. And I will talk more about this in session four on the 13th of October. In terms of customs, the EU must have an EORI number with the revenue commissioners. And uh, Ray Ryan from Revenue at a talk last week for the construction sector uh, said very, very clearly that there is quite a number of businesses who have still not registered uh, with revenue with their EORI number. You get the information you will need as an importer from your UK supplier if you are continuing on that route. And then you need to arrange for transport to or from Europe to go direct uh, or via land bridge. Now, 
what is very important here is uh, ISPM wood packaging materials if you are conducting transport uh, between the UK and Ireland. And a lot of products are shipped on pallets, whether they are exported or imported. Now, the, the Plant Health Regulation of 2016 sets out requirements for wood packaging material associated with goods imported from third countries, and this legislation changed in December 2019. Um, importers from third countries should ensure that their wood packaging material associated with their imports meets the requirements of ISPM 15 as set out in the above regulation. And this stamp should be placed on all uh, timber pallets. And exporters to third countries should be aware that compliance with ISPM 15 is likely to be an import requirement. It does not generally apply to wood packaging material for intra-community trade uh, with certain exceptions. Um, so this is the type of symbol that you would see on a pallet. And I have a sample here. I don't know if you can see it clearly here, but you must, uh, the, at customs, they will have to see this on the pallet. And bear in mind that during the transition period, um, the UK will continue to be treated as a member state for ISPM 15. However, there are 100 million pallets in the UK. In Ireland, there are 15 pallet manufacturers. This whole uh, system is overseen by the Department of Agriculture, but we in NSCI, we certify uh, the 15 pallet manufacturers. And finally, media reports indicate that the majority of pallets in the UK are not ISPM 15 compliant. So that's another thing that you need to check for your checklist. Finally, um, we in NSCI, we have a series of fact sheets and we're not going to bombard you with them now. These are live documents. Uh, which are going to be changed between now and the end of the year to reflect the free trade agreement negotiations and what is coming, what is coming down the tracks. Um, and these are available from our website. We also have frequently asked questions for electrical equipment and for medical devices, all on our NSCI website. And then one, uh, we also have done online presentations. So at your leisure, you can uh, read and hear more about uh, CE marking economic operators, which I've covered, specific EU legislation for construction, medical devices, and electrical equipment. And uh, at the moment, this uh, presentation uh, is uh, being currently revised as things are changing at such a rate. Um, and they're all available on our website, nsai.ie forward slash Brexit. Now, what is uh, very important that you can download is the EU document on the blue guide. And this is for the implementation of EU product rules and uh, last published in 2016. It's currently under revision as Brexit is here, but it can be downloaded and it relates to uh, 32 directives and regulations. Now, I hope I haven't really wrecked your head for the last 15 minutes, but thank you for your attention. And I'm gonna hand you back now over to the Okay, Mary, thank you very much. Um, very illuminating, maybe a little bit scary for people there. But before we kind of go into anything, we just want to let you know, we do have a lot of information on our website. We have a lot of recorded presentations and we can also make Mary's presentation available. So we are aware there is a lot of information there and I suppose the Q&A, uh, I hope, will, uh, will help us, um, will help some of you or ease some of your worries. So. I actually had a lot of questions prepared, but I see a good few coming in. So I'm going to start with one um, from the chat from Elaine. Uh, and she's asking, um, would a construction company be considered to be a distributor when using imported building supplies? And if so, what administration function do they have? So Mary, I think I suppose I'll start with you there. Um, I think it is something we touched on as well, Neil, about importers. So uh, Mary, maybe you could take that for us. Uh, so if you are importing from the 1st of January 2021, you become the importer. If you're importing from the third country, which the UK will be um, from the 1st of January. So you won't be a distributor, but then if you distribute to um, other suppliers in Ireland, then they are the distributor, but you're not the distributor. Okay. You're the importer. Neil, is there anything you want to add there? Or? Um, yeah, ju just to say that this is going to um, 
what I mean, what we politely say to people is that um, Brexit will actually present opportunities for what we call intermediation. Um, so this has not existed as a thing within the EU since the establishment of the single market. This stuff just happens and you don't pay for it. It just comes in. Um, what you're going to find now is that um, importers in whatever category of trade you're in, certain warehousing uh, um, professionals and things like that are going to... In, um, there will be a solution available to you, um, but it is going to cost you money. So uh, there will be people who will do this for you. There will be costs of administration, of customs, of duties, and of time that arise in, in terms of paperwork and certifying this stuff. Um, and it comes at a cost to the end user. That's, that's the simple point we're making. And that exists in both directions. So if you're exporting to the UK, the same problem will arise on the far side. But it is your duty, whether you're an importer or a distributor here, to just make sure that that is being done uh, in line with the new world we'll be in on the 2nd of January. Okay. Um, I, I'm I gonna. Think, yeah. yeah, I just want to clarify. Yeah. The, Elaine asked the question, would a construction company be considered to be a distributor? Mm. But if, the comp if the construction company is directly importing from the UK manufacturer, they are the importer. But if the construction company is going to Heaton's or to Chadwick's, they're the distributor. Mm. Heaton's or Chadwick's would be the importer. So that's the differentiator okay. there. Okay, yeah, an important one. Okay, we're going to keep going. We want to, we, time is actually a little against us, so we're going to fly through these if we can. So the next question is from Jim, and Jim is asking, the new CE UK Northern Ireland marking, is this sufficient for use in the Republic of Ireland? No, the UK, the new mark only applies in the jurisdiction of Northern Ireland. And if you are Northern Ireland manufacturer, and if you are import or exporting to Great Britain, Britain, it will be recognized there. It will not be recognized in the Republic of Ireland. Okay. The CE okay. mark is what you would have to have. And we are, that is something that we are gonna discuss in later webinars as well, just to let people know the CE mark will be, will, will be covered in more detail. Elaine, just coming back to you as well with regard to your construction, we do have a construction webinar coming up and that'll be on the 6th of October. So it might be worthwhile tuning in there as well. It'll be a little bit more focused on your, your sector. We have a question from Carol. Um, Carol is asking, if you appoint a authorised representative in the EU, do they then take over the responsibilities of the importer? Are they no longer the manufacturer and do they not have the legal requirements? Will I repeat that for you guys? So no, you I, I can point... see the question. Uh, okay, the, very good. Um, if you appoint an authorised representative is appointed by the manufacturer. So at the moment, if you've been manufacturing in the UK, um, you don't need an authorised representative, say, in Ireland. But because you will be coming from a third country, the UK manufacturer must appoint the authorised representative in Ireland. The authorised representative does not can be can be an importer can also be an authorized representative but the reason the manufacturer may not want to give his technical precious information to an importer is that the for ip reasons mm -hmm. so the manufacturer has the choice to appoint somebody that they trust uh, and, and not that they don't trust an importer but um if the manufacturer is um just uh, uh, exporting his products right across europe he only needs to have one authorised uh, representative for Europe. Okay, okay, Carol, I hope that answers your questions, but we will have some follow-ups afterwards if there's a little, uh, still a few grey areas there. Uh, next question then comes in from Gary. Gary's asking, is there an online resource available to establish if goods a distributor imports require the CE marking? So is there any kind of website that it can go to? Well, um, we're, we're developing that, that material, but, but Gary... Yeah. Um, There's no uh, one place, I don't think, Gary. There isn't a one-stop okay. shop for this, this kind of live information. But if you want to email me afterwards, I can, I can give you help on this. What I would advise people is very, very clearly that if the, to get back onto you, your UK suppliers, find out from them, for example, if you were uh, in, importing uh, a socket with a USB connector that I showed you there or a, uh, or a smoke alarm, um, 
up to date, they may be, have been using UK notified bodies and those UK notified bodies will be wiped off the European database and the manufacturer will have to source an EU27 uh, notified body to be able to place the product on the market. Now, under the withdrawal agreement, um, it has been made clear that the, uh, the uh, UK notified bodies are to make it easy for people to transfer the files over to an EU notified body. So that's what the manufacturer has to do. So you go back to your supply chain. You, if you're a distributor here, you, uh, you check with either your uh, supplier in the UK, whether it's an importer or whether it's a manufacturer, but check that. But it's very okay. important. Anybody who places a product that requires CE marking on the market must ensure that it is now done from the 1st of January by an EU 27 notified body. And in two years ago, we only had three notified bodies in Ireland. Now we've 18 and seven are for the construction sector. And actually, Mary, just as you touch on the CE marking, Joanna has a, has a question there about CE marking. And is it, she says, uh, aren't the current CE markings acceptable until the end of June 2023? Well, if uh, the, e, uh, the UK government on the 1st of September made announcements and they've given a transition period for those uh, for CE marking for industrial products uh, extending to the 1st of January 2022, so there's a whole year uh, yeah. you have transition, but for medical devices it is until the 1st of July 2023. Okay, so that's a little bit of good news, Joanna. There is a bit it more is time there. Yeah. We're very, very happy to hear that because yeah. it gives businesses breathing space. Okay. And just, to, I suppose, before, just to, to come back to you, Neil, there, just in terms of, I suppose, your own members, um, maybe you, you could give us an example there, I suppose, if you can think of anyone off the top of your head who has been dealing with some of these issues and maybe how they're addressing them now as we come closer to that deadline. Yeah, um, and, and just to pick up on, on Mary's one uh, there, um, this is where Irish importers in particular are going to have to get quite clever. So um, you will find as an Irish importer, if you are buying from a UK manufacturer that is a substantial exporter, and I mean that isn't just exporting to the U uh, to to Ireland. You know, just mm. what they would view as their domestic market via, via Northern Ireland. Uh, you're probably at, you know, there's probably a risk of drift in standards and certification here. You will find if you're dealing with a blue chip manufacturer in the UK, they are going to have this stuff boxed off already, and they they are going to be able to that they will be paying. Uh, to make sure that this stuff is uh, is properly certified and the standards in place are, are, are in place at this end, whether they are brass plating a solution here or in France or somewhere, they, they will do that. But it, you really do have to watch with smaller UK manufacturers. We know uh, from the trades that a lot of them are not ready for this. They're not aware of this impact on it. So it is an area where uh, you're, you're going to have to watch out. I, I'll give you a really simple example of one of our wholesalers um, who buys a lot of toys from China via a UK distributor. Now, toys um, have to have a CE mark uh, yeah. on them. And at the moment, <clears throat> uh, our member's uh, toy importer is, is going from a relatively small UK distributor he does not have a solution in place uh, for those toys yet. Now, someone, th this is not rocket science and it can be done, but it means that someone picks up the tab for that, either in the UK or in Dublin at point of import, but that has to be in place. That's the important okay. thing. And just yeah, to follow yeah. on from what Neela said there, if that toy has to have a particular test done, like CE marking, 80% of products placed on the market that are CE marked are done by self-certification. They don't have to go through a notified body. However, if they're self-certifying and if the tests have to be done on that toy, then that is very, very important for the technical file. Um, and this information, I don't want to get too techy-techy into this, but it is very important that the tests that are carried out, uh, where those tests are carried out, because moving forward, we are unsure and I'm um, not want to be definitive, but we're very unsure, yes, will UK test certificates. I'm hoping they will be recognized, but we don't know that. And there's a lot of questions out there still, D, that we cannot answer. And we yes. won't have clarity on this until January. We just don't know because yeah. the talks are taking place. So sure. 
there's yeah. a lot there's a lot of stuff there so i suppose the message is keep in touch with is me and ourselves in 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 latest information we put up as much as we can up on our website uh, to keep people informed but by all means please come back to us and email yeah. us and we'll answer your queries yeah and just to add to that we will i suppose whenever there is updates we will uh, we update our own fact sheets on the website we and through social media we'll let people know that they have been updated based on latest talks um can i just quickly i see we're a little bit over time i know you mentioned the eori numbers neil has that become an issue for members there or do you, are you taking a lot of queries about that uh, we have been beating the eori <laughs> uh, issue for two years and it, it is amazing when you see the stats coming out from the revenue of the number of businesses that are known to be importing who are not using eori, EORI numbers so look all we can do uh, and NSAI can do is it's it's actually very easy to get. It's one thing that revenue uh, the, the customs can spit out for you really quickly, but just mm. get it now. Okay. Well, we might leave that as your takeaway, Mary. What about yourself? I suppose there are lots of different issues, but if you had maybe a one tip to give away to people today about how they can even uh, we're hoping I suppose a lot of people have begun their preparedness, but if they haven't, where do they begin? Um, check your suppliers in the UK. I think we in Ireland were far more knowledgeable and I don't think they're as up to date as we are. Please check your suppliers, check the, t uh, the paperwork, check if they're bringing your product in, um, who has certified the product? Is it a UK notified body or is it an EU27? Because they, they, they may not be aware of it. And mm -hmm. this, I, I've become aware of this recently where a company is distributing a new type of energy product and was using a UK notify body, didn't know now that his whole distribution is going to have to change, is now asking the UK supplier who was unaware of it, we, you now need to go to an EU27, otherwise I'm gonna to have to change my business. Okay, okay, we're gonna to have to leave it there for this morning. Thanks everybody for participating and for everyone attending. Uh, Neil, thanks very much and Mary. Just to remind people as well, this is the first in a series of four. So uh, next week on the 29th, we are gonna be focusing on the med tech sector. Um, we on the 6th it's construction I know there's a couple of construction companies here today so you're very welcome to, to come back for that um, and then on the 13th of October we have something for focusing on the local enterprise office on the Leos um, you can find further details on that on our website nsai.ie or if you want to check out any of our social media platforms uh, we will be giving updates there so that's it for the moment. Uh, thanks, folks. Um, and any information, please feel free to email us as well. Uh, you can email me directly, deirdre.farrelly at nsai.ie. Sorry, I don't have that on a slide for you. Um, okay, we'll leave it there. Thank you, everyone. Nice look. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.